And then, yes, you're right. We have endless journey in common. I am on the committee that's helping plan the gala. So oh, I've been okay. going to the office and meeting with them. And last year I went and it was beautiful. Um, and then they am, have my husband's grandma too. Uh, well, I am, I am so honored to be the keynote for that event. Uh, it's a true stepping stone in my speaking career. I was chatting with a, a friend of mine who's a widow um, just the other day we were talking about finding our purpose in life our new purpose mm -hmm. and uh, she said she you know hadn't found hers yet and and was you know continuing to pray about it and so on and and I said well don't you know do the butterfly thing you know sit and let it land on you don't chase it and all that mm -hmm. and uh, and she was saying oh yours is your yours is so clear. You're you you found your your purpose and your calling so quickly. You know, my my wife's been gone almost two years, and my daughter nearly three years, mm -hmm. and um, um, the uh, um, I told her the I said no. Um, I have been working on developing this kind of thing for decades, literally, and just lately life threw me the 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 wrinkle of of what my topic is and i earned it the hard way um but i but i have a topic yeah sorry no i'm not sorry <laughs> no, not sorry and not it's sorry. it's um it's deeply emotional and it's universal well, that's what I, I found. I mean, I, I, I tell, and that's a segue into why I wrote the book. I'll throw that in. Uh, you know, I, I had the double whammy. I lost my wife and daughter nine months apart. My, my wife, my daughter was 31, almost 32 years old, and I've been married for 40 years. And mm -hmm. um, due to that double whammy, I call it, I, I, I went deep on grief support groups yes. because I, I just thought I should and would and could and needed them. And uh, one time I was at <clears throat> at a, a, the mortuary at their monthly support group. And um, um, I had just happened to be in the in the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time at, after the meeting. And a lady who I call Marge, because I don't know her real name, you know, um, she's probably in her 60s or 70s. And uh, uh, she came up to me and I had said something during the meeting that triggered something. That's why she came up to me. And then she talked to me and went on and on and, and basically lost it emotionally uh, about her, her loss of her husband who died apart from her. She at their cabin far away from Omaha mm. and she was beating herself up about the fact that she should have been with him and she felt like she could have saved him, which was obviously not true. He died really, really quickly. And, um, um, you know, just went through all that early grief emotion thing and, and just, you know, let it all hang out there and crying and gave me a huge hug afterwards. And, you know, I'm saying I'm at this grief group for me. I'm here for my needs. And but my loss was a little long, longer ago than her loss. And but then when she thanked me and, you know, I, again, I didn't really do anything but stand there and listen. And which is what was important. Mm -hmm. um, I said, you know, that felt really good. That felt really good to help somebody else. And she really appreciated and, and needed somebody mm -hmm. at that moment to, to, to bring that in. And, and I said, I want to do more of that. And maybe I'll, I had written a couple other books and I said, maybe I'll write a book about grief. And so I went to my computer at home and looked at, uh, uh, looked at good old Amazon and looked at her grief books. And you know what I'm going to say? About 3,000, 3,500 titles. Okay. So a couple had been written on it. <laughs> the world does not need another book on grief. You know, there's just plenty of them out there. And they all kind of say the same thing sometimes. Anyway, I so I kind of put that away. And then another time at a different grief group, I'm looking around the room. And there's, uh, at this one, there was probably about 21, 22 women mm -hmm. and five guys. Hmm. And I go, hmm. You know, I mean, I, as you can tell, I have no problem speaking my mind, but, uh, um, you know, there, some of these guys were pretty bottled up and, and I'm also wondering why are there so few men here? And I went on to research that. And, and, and of course that eventually led to men grief too. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, um, it, it, there's just, you know, I, I, I narrowed it down. I said, I want to help other people with their grief. Uh, and then I think men is a good subset of that because I am a man and, and, uh, and, and so on. So that's kind of how it got born. Wow. And that's such a, I mean, you pointed out men in the meeting seemed bottled up. A little bit. I mean, uh, there's one guy I know, he, he came and he's, he was, uh, he was, he's a kind of a speaker by for his industry. I mean, so he's got no problem communicating. Um, but he came to the meeting and he said, I'm not saying one word for the first three meetings. And it, this one was a thir- grief share. You've heard of that. Um, this one was a 13 week session. And um, he, he just planned on the front end. I'm not going to say a word. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, you know, not not because he's a man, just because I mean, well, maybe it is, you know, it's all that conditioning, societal stuff and all that. And he uh, just listened. And, you know, that's completely fine at the meetings to be able to just listen. That's encouraged. In fact, if you don't want to talk, you just pass to the next person. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it's uh, I think, you know, uh, guys of my generation and older, um, you know, grew up our our dads, our coaches, our uncles, uh, you know, kind of had that John Wayne mentality. Mm -hmm. um, John Wayne, actor from 30, 40 years of yes. military, um, cowboy, you know, fight, and rub some dirt on it and suffer pilgrim and don't like saying much at all. And, you know, just known for his toughness and all that. And so uh, uh, we we kind of grew up with that. And he kind of, I don't know if he resembled society or society resembled him, right. but you know what I'm saying. They're, you yes. know, men tend to be a little bit more emotionally unavailable. Have you seen that? Um, in my life or? <laughs> well, in, in, even in your work, I mean, when you're, you yes. the caregiving thing that you, you're about. Um, typically, you know, it's a detach woman. a little bit from that or not? Yes, for sure. No, typically it's the a woman, a wife, a daughter that is doing the caregiving. If it's even um, in a marriage, maybe it's the the man's mother or father and the wife tends to be the one to jump in and yeah. um well i mean we could debate forever back to the cavemen and women about you know all the provider and cave cave right. thing and all that stuff and right. genetics and caregiving and nurture versus nature and all those kind of things but you know some of those things affect us even today and so i i see that out there and i i in my book i mentioned that uh i talk about um traumatic stress syndrome and all that mm. and post-traumatic stress syndrome and um uh, you know the the good the guys and gals coming home from the middle east wars iraq and and afghanistan and such uh mm-hmm. you know they're younger they're <clears throat> they're in their 30s and 20s and they didn't necessarily grow up with john wayne or that john wayne mentality and they seem to be a little more open don't you think um i feel like culturally we are trending to a more i guess there's that term metrosexual you know where yeah. a guy <laughs> more, while, yeah i know what you mean yeah open to this idea of expressing emotion i think women are stepping into their own strength and power you know we're, we're finding kind of i loved your uh level on the front of your book, you know, oh, I think yeah. we're finding yeah. some balance with that. Yeah, yeah. I think what's so confusing um, about grief is the grief journey. And what I have heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the seven steps of grief were specifically written for people who had passed away from a cancer diagnosis. There was something about it that was tied to a really specific thing, but it grief feels much more fluid and um, encompassing. Sure. Well, in, yeah. in, in, uh, in, in case one of your listeners yeah. hasn't heard about it, uh, you're, you're referring to the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross uh, five phases of death of, I'm sorry, five phases of grief. Uh, yeah. Uh, story and that was written I think in the 60s 1960s and she actually wrote it when she had cancer and she was dying now obviously wrote it before she died but uh um and and that became I think that was kind of one of the first studies or or books or content about grief and and the whole concept of it and somehow uh society 
glommed on to that and yes. said, okay, you know, my first step of grief is going to be, was it, is it denial, the first one or whatever? I can't remember. Um, you know, and, and there's, she has five things, denial, acceptance, anger, depression, and I'm forgetting one other. Maybe acceptance. Yeah. That, that, did I say that? Um, yeah. yeah. There, there's the five phases there. And what, what has come under fire within the last, I don't know, several years of, not fire, but just a further study is that, you know, that somehow told people that they had to grieve like this. You start, you know, okay, I'm going to deny that my wife has died. I'm going to just put it out of my life and I'm going to sweep it under the rug. I call that sweepers in my book. Uh, men are sweeping all the, the feeling up under the rug instead of acknowledging it. And, you know, that's what she would call denial. Well, the, in her, what was assigned to her, whether she intended it or not, was that, okay, after I'm done with my denial, then I'll go to my anger. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so for somehow that society was thinking, okay, you go through this phase, then you go through this phase, then you go through this phase, and your, your word nailed it. And Michelle, you said fluid. Mm. It is more fluid than that. And, um, you know, I, I, yeah, I mean, that's, that, uh, that's a perfect word for it. Cause there, there is no roadmap. There is no right way to do it for men or women. And I think just hearing that gives us a sense of, gives me, I'll speak for myself, gives me a sense of peace uh, and maybe permission is a word that I'm looking for. Perfect. Perfect. Um, because I never know how it's going to show up for me on any given day. We had five people, um, four of which were family members, pass away in a year's time frame. Wow. And we current, and this is like within the last year, my husband's wow. father just passed That's away amazing. last February. And then my aunt passed and then my cousin passed unexpectedly. And then his grandmother passed. And, and prior to that, I had a good friend who unexpectedly died. Wow. Um, and then currently, presently, his mother's on hospice and he has an uncle who has is a nearing end of life. So we're just swirled up. And like life most, is transition, isn't it? <laughs> it is a transition. Um, <laughs> but how does that? Life. Yeah, you're you're talking about how peaceful that is for you to know it's fluid and there's no run one right right, right. and and I think to not feel like there's a stage I have to get through to achieve Absolutely. a higher rung you know maybe it's a we were um, making dinner on a Sunday and I had poured I mean, it gets me teary I had poured olive oil and balsamic in a little plate put the parmesan in there and I'm dipping bread and I was like oh god Raj would have loved this oh yeah yeah <laughs> and then I'm just like <laughs> losing it <laughs> Of course, there's yeah. all those triggers, yeah. And I, I, I talk about it in a book too. I, I talk about tears moments, and uh, tears yeah. is an acronym, an acronym which I won't go through all of. But uh, mm. T is triggers, and that, you know that's that's old news in the grief world. Everybody knows about triggers. Uh, for me, triggers are 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 kind of an ongoing mystery. I mean, I obviously, uh, oh, you know, I, I I was a caregiver and for four years for my wife and grocery shopping, man's the house, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, and, and she always liked avocados. And I was never a big fan of the raw, fresh avocado, even though they're very healthy, I guess. And <laughs> um, anyway, so, so I always made sure to buy avocados. And, and when she passed and I'm grocery shopping, well, I, I don't buy them for myself, but I stopped in front of the avocado stand and bent over and cried in my cart more than once. You know, and I'm sure the people in the store thought I was having a heart attack or something, but, <laughs> you know, that is a huge trigger. And yeah. and even though I don't stop and cry on my cart anymore, when I see that, I'll think about it every time. And and it's just that way with triggers. And, you know, how long before that goes away? Well, after almost two years, you know, I, I still think about it. I don't know that that spin cycle of avocados, but, um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't cry each time but I think about it but the so when you're in your familiar zone um those triggers obviously hit you but they become less and less over time in most cases um the 
thing I noticed, the point of this whole story is that when I, so you're going through your daily routine. Oh, we ate restaurant at that restaurant. Oh, that was a clinic I took her to. Oh, this, oh, that. You know, just to drive through town is, is makes you crazy. Um, mm -hmm. But um, then I took a trip in October and that got me out of my routine. And um, I immediately there experiencing new things, new sites, found myself, I got to go home and tell Lisa about this. I got to go tell Lisa about this. And Lisa had been gone for a year and a half. And, uh, you know, even though I'd stopped doing that about my daily routine about Omaha, driving around town or whatever, mm -hmm. or avocados in the store, I um, thought about it from this trip because there's new triggers, you know, new adventures, new things. So uh, with that many people you've lost, your, uh, your life is going to be full of triggers, Michelle, for quite a while. Yes. And it's uh, a balance when I'm in a space where my mission and purpose is to help family caregivers. And I'm really tapping into those losses to use as fuel to serve and help as many people as possible. That's good. That's great. Because, uh, you know, sometimes I, I feel like, oh, you know, oh, you're Paul, you're, you're, uh, I don't know what the word exploiting the deaths of your wife and your daughter here. You're, you're writing a book and people pay you for that. And people pay you to speak on the stage. And, um, you know, I, I, I back off that and, you know, yes, those things are true. Um, but, um, a friend of mine called it, uh, a calling Yeah. Um, speaking, especially to men, not only to them, but especially to them, um, and helping them with and through their grief. And so that, and, and my new angle of it is, you know, I don't want to be known as the grief guy. How depressing is that? <laughs> and so my, my new angle and, and uh, the one I'm going to go with uh, at, uh, as a keynote speaker at Endless Journeys Gala is uh, from grief to gratitude. And so mm. that's uh, where I'm headed. And uh, I think that's where we all need to head. And that's, you know, I go back to the, to the level guy here you know the level thing and yes. so uh, in my book i call it i call that final stage and i ross might call it uh acceptance i call it keepers and that's where you know you're you're keeping the essence of their life as part of yours of course uh, a part of you a part of you a part of me is you that will never die you know and so that's that's a lady gaga phrase that i that I like actually. And uh, the point is that the keeper is, is it, I use little tools uh, as analogies to each section of my weepers, sheepers, leapers, and keepers, uh, the types of things that men go through. And um, on the keeper end, uh, that I, the tool, it's not really a tool. I, I use the idea of varnish. And mm -hmm. that's where you have, uh, you if you worked in a wood shop before and created a small wood say footstool like I did in high school shop mm -hmm. you know you sand and fix and cut and assemble and all that what's the final stage you put some varnish on it and make it right. it, you, it changes it it prepares it it finalizes it not with we're ever done finalizing our grief anything like that um but it's that it, it's just that final finished uh finished view type of thing so anyway just no, I love point. that. And I, I think one of the things that people are searching for are how do I take all of these pieces of my grief and the journey and the experiences and then build something and create something? Because, um, you know, that first phase for me and many people I know is like, you're just trying to catch your breath. Right. And once you feel like your head is a little bit above water and you, you're starting to see some sunshine and you're trying to figure out how to operate in the world without them. Like, what, what am I supposed to do next? Oh, yeah. Well, that, that whole identity thing. I mean, you know, we were, a, I'm, I met my wife. Um, I was 20 years old. She was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we were not fully functioning formed adults. We're just <laughs> old adolescents at that point. And you go for 40 years and you have the kids and buy the house and have the bills and all that stuff. And, uh, yeah. you know, it, it, it's your identity. It is who you are. And, uh, and all of a sudden that's not, not all of a sudden, but then it's not there. 
and uh and, and uh oh great um anyway uh the uh, the point is that you have to figure out who you are and 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 that's kind of why i like going to these grief groups is that we're a like-minded group of people everybody's lost somebody and i've got new friends lots of new friends there and you know mm -hmm. so i can relate to them number one number two uh these are new identity you know they're all looking for new friends too so right you know, it's just a, a it becomes a social event actually um one of my dear friends her mother has been going regularly to a grief group the last 18 months since um her her father passed away and um she they have become such good friends this group that they're traveling together and they're oh, having wow. these life adventures now yeah. together um yeah. So do you well, think that's part of the formula is kind of doing something different? Well, like, it, you, it, you know, or? it depends. On, yeah. I mean, in, in, in the book, I talk about leapers. Um, those are just what you think that that's the guy who uh, um, changes most everything right away. You know, oh. um, example I put out there, a, a, a woman told me about her father who lost her mother and uh the guy got married uh three months afterwards <laughs> remarried <laughs> like he would be a leaper he's mm -hmm. leaping into you know, are you masking your grief at that point i'm saying yes because mm -hmm. i you know i'm much further out than that and, and not that i'm anybody uh to look for uh, look up to but the point is that uh, what are you covering up what are you doing and so yes uh the change thing what you talk about is is something i think we all have to manage because it when you're in that state, you don't don't think straight at all, and so you do need to be careful. Um, but what you talk about the travelers, and you know, you said um, you just need to do something, and 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 that's the absolute formula I found. I, I'll tell you about a guy I know whose name is Don. He was married even longer than I was. I think fifty years. Lost his wife. I think he's I don't know how old he is, but older than me. But he. Uh, he, you should see the guy. He's he's a joyful guy. I see him all the time at the grief groups. Joyful guy. He became an ombudsman for a nursing home people. Oh my god! Oh, and so he's I, I, he's got to be seventy five. And I think uh, I know who you're talking about. Probably yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he probably do. And uh, and he goes out and he, you know, there's a guy at a nursing home and he can't get the right wheelchair and and Don goes in there and and you, you should see the joy. It almost gives me goosebumps that Don has helping this guy out as an ombudsman for him at a nursing home. And 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 that's the kind of thing he would never have probably done if he was married and you know staying home and watching the Wheel of Fortune or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. now he's got this whole new life and he's he's just what you said, he's doing something. As far as traveling to new companions, that's a that's a whole other podcast. Yeah. <laughs> And a, and a juicy one, and, and what I need, like to talk about, but uh, she's you know, on Instagram. Her pictures are spectacular. Oh wow, time. that's pretty yeah. cool. Well, I mean, and you know, and what I've been told is that you know a lot of people don't want to get remarried, but they do want companionship. Mm -hmm. And so, what's wrong? I mean, they're all grown ups, and find someone who has similar interests and enjoy it together. I'll go for it, you know. And right. I mean, I do know people who say, uh, you know, I lost my spouse. And that was the love of my life, my soulmate. And in my book, Men Grief Too, what I do is I even, I mentioned, and I'm no expert, but I say there's over 7 billion people in the world. And you're telling me that that person you happen to meet that lived across the hall in the apartment or you went to school with or college with or high school with is the only person in the world you'll ever be close to again? Mm. I just, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm in my sixties. I hope to live another 30 years. And, you know, I, I'm kind of sad if I think I'll never have another relationship like that again. I mean, of course it won't be the same. I had all my firsts with Lisa, right. you know, my, my first kids, my first house, my first everything. And, and that will never be repeated. And I'm not going to try to repeat it. I'm right. going to, create try to create new things and I jump in the RV with 
like your friend or whatever, mm -hmm. they, whatever they, however they travel and, uh, and, and experience new things that way. So, so it uh, sounds like there's just an openness and curiosity and just being willing to try things, explore, um, and to hold, hold yourself along the way that I can be grieving and do these things. Well, perfect segue to um, one thing I mentioned whenever I talk or talk with people individually even. Um, her name is Colleen. Uh, she lost her husband and uh, she wrote a, not a published book, but just an assembly of pages and jottings and stuff. And, and it, that's the first place I read it. And she says, um, grief is always with you. You just get used to it. Mm. And I just think that covers so much ground, don't you, Michelle? I do think it does. I feel like I I still want my mind wants to put it on a scale though. Right? Like um the rawness, the freshness, the the tears at the avocado <coughs> stand, you know, at the grocery store and that there's some mo mobility with it that it it's always there but it's somehow softer and it may trigger up um but there's an adaptability that we have with yeah. grief yeah well I, I i've heard it i just heard last week about another extreme about a a guy who lost his wife and six years ago i i've not met the guy i just heard a story so who knows if it's how much of it's true but mm -hmm. um, six years ago lost his wife uh, still keeps her car registered, still has her clothes. Um, you know, this would be a person who was stuck in his grief. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. but you, as you say, um, you know, the human soul, the human spirit is adaptable. It is strong. I've seen lots of progress in these people that I, I go to grief groups with. I've seen progress in myself. I don't have to stop at the avocado stand anymore. <laughs> right. You know, and, and, um, not that it's not important, but it it's just we do adapt and we always carry it with us. Uh, um, and, uh, the uh, uh, Sharon Zender uh, is wrote a book called Crosswords for Grief, and she uh, worked for at Heavey Hoffman, uh, Devorah Cutler funeral home for many years in their aftercare, and she she led those Sunday night classes. And one time she had a great great visual for this. She had a a big, huge suitcase. I don't know if it was filled with rocks or what, but something pretty mm -hmm. heavy. And then she had a medium-sized um, tote bag, which had some weight to it as well. And then mm -hmm. she had a like a purse-size thing, which had some weight to it, but you know was was smaller. And she had three people carry those items around the room. And the the guy that got the suitcase, I mean, he could hardly budge it. It was super heavy. And, right. and and you know with the analogy the story and it's just like at the end the the gal who had the the purse like thing manageable almost like a normal purse um you know she was moving and she could walk around but it was there right right and her point just beautifully illustrates that you know grief is always with you but you get used to it right i just love that that story yeah that, i think that's fantastic it's like another what that what's coming to my mind is when you ask someone to hold a cup of water and it's not how much the cup weighs it's how long you're trying to hold it for right, um, right. That, that's exhausting you know and then I think part of what it is is um time I think time is really confusing and an example of that would be if I put on a song that you jammed out to in high school, you're taken back, right? And Ooh. I think when we have these these grief experiences, time is going on, marching on, and you start to lose track sometimes because you're just motoring through your day. I coached this woman and in our um, first consult call, we worked together for three months, first consult call, she kept referring to the fact that she was a widow. And well, you know, because I'm a widow and I'm a widow and, and, and ultimately I asked, well, when did your loved one pass away? And her, her husband had passed away 14 years prior. Wow. And so wow. she was just very, very stuck and attached to the story 
about being a widow. And I use this, the word story, I think judiciously, you know, carefully, oh, but like yeah. just very attached to yeah. being a widow. And so it really just informed all her decisions throughout her day. So I don't know, yeah. just what are your thoughts on time and the passage of time? Yeah. Well, your, your, your story about her brings up a couple of things. So, uh, um, one of them is that, uh, uh, I think that some people, I mean, and it's it's especially evident during the early raw phases of grief, you know, the, the victim thing, especially mm -hmm. those poor people who lost a child in a car wreck or something like that. And I met I met a couple in their 30s who lost a 14 and a 16 year old, the same car wreck. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine the trauma? Not one, yeah. but two at one wreck. I mean, just is so I mean, they, they didn't represent themselves as victims in any way. They were very amazing um mm -hmm. but uh the the point is that some people i think men sometimes even more so harbor that that i'm a victim you know maybe even god is punishing me you know mm. all these kind of things and 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 you know i i don't i'm not a psychologist i cannot tell you what fuels a victim mentality but some people do that I, i've seen it with some things as simple as divorce you know, I, right. I, my my son and I have a joke about someone we both know who's on Facebook and um, it, it says status, it says divorced, I think in all caps, and <laughs> she's been divorced for about 12 years. <laughs> like, let it go. Wow. <laughs> you know, and that's kind of remind me of, of your friend who, or your connection yeah. who uh, had a, a widow for 14 years. What labels do we assign to ourselves? You know, am I a victim? I mean, some people like wearing that victim hat sometimes. And so I don't think that's healthy. I'm, I'm not going to say I've never done it, but, um, mm -hmm. but there's that. The yeah, second thing um, is is that, and, and again, I'm going above my my education level here when I talk about this, the, the idea of uh, that grief, uh, I've read this, has uh, could give you a little endorphin shot. I mean, mm -hmm. by reliving that grief, you know, I mean, I, I met a woman in my grief group and, and she can go full on to tears in like two seconds of, and her husband's been gone over a year now. And, um, you know, I'm not saying she's doing that on purpose to give herself that, that neurological kick, mm -hmm. but people, I think should be aware of that. That's possible that, you know, uh, in the absence of something else, you know, grief is love that doesn't have anywhere to go. In the absence of somewhere mm -hmm. else, something else, maybe they're they're living on that just a little too much. So uh, maybe the victim thing, or maybe the whole um, endorphin type kick I get when I revisit all that, or adrenaline. I'm not sure what the, the hormonal <laughs> thing is, but you know what I mean? Have you ever seen anything like that? Well, and just, you know, thinking through back to that woman with the, who had been a widow for 14 years, she was unaware that that she had mentioned it literally six or eight times in a 45 minute span. And so um, just that awareness alone, pardon? Did you point it out to her? Of course, because that was the baseline of, of our working together and the coaching and That's by our, the end of our time together, she felt like she had a new lease on life because she is so felt excited. very that's, stuck. That's a goosebump story, Michelle. That's that's awesome. It really is. And she felt like through the work and our conversations and the coaching, she was able to come into some present day awareness. But really, you know, it was it took some processing. And it, it, there's just, again, time is very fluid. There's no timeline. I really don't want people to get this idea that we are assigning how long yeah. anyone should be. It's just, it's just having an awareness of yourself and it where are you at and what do you need? Right. Because well, if you are needing something different, then yeah. it's worth exploring what that might look like. Right. Right. Well, your story reminds me of uh, a woman I met at a uh, grief group, and I'll, uh, I don't know, I'll call her Susan, I, that's not her name, but uh, um, she was at my table one night and been married for uh, uh, 51 years, mm -hmm. and um, her husband had a, a fairly rapid demise, but there was a period where he was in the hospital for 
you know, some very critical days there at the end. And um, she's married happily, and and I could just tell she was a, a wonderful wife, I'm sure, um, for for all those years. And and she lost him like three years ago, mm-hmm. and she was still coming to the grief group. And I think she was seeking some kind of <laughs> I don't know what, but the she was har- carrying this guilt three years ago, yeah. carrying this guilt about it. she. You know, she's the consummate hostess. She's of the age group where, you know, you're the, the Emily Post, Emily mm-hmm. whatever. The yes. Perfect etiquette person, you know, the ultimate hostess and all that. Well, when all these family members came to the hospital, uh, she's out there giving them all comfort, talking to them, keeping them informed just outside the hospital room. And her husband did die. And I, I don't know if she was with him or not. That's not the point of the story. But she felt tremendous guilt after th- three years um, that she wasn't spending more time and attention on him. Mm-hmm. Instead, she was out doing this hostess thing. And and it could just, I could just see it, it was like it was that heavy suitcase thing with her. Right. And, and 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 I said, you know, Susie, I said, you gave. 51 years of your life and your kids and your grandkids of a great life to your husband. And don't let 51 minutes that you maybe made a mistake ruin your the rest of your life. Right. And, and who's to and say you, it's you a can mistake? Literally right? see her yeah. sit up straighter. Yeah. That was so rewarding. This is why I go to these grief groups. Yes. No, that's not so much to, for my benefit anymore, although it's, they all help, but it's hopefully maybe I can help somebody else. Right. And the bottom line is death is permanent yeah. and we never feel like we have enough time, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. You know, I mean, even with my 96 year old grandmothers who it was a slower decline and right. you know, yeah. it's just so final. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. No it's way. so final. And um, I really wish, I just want to offer people that um, we get to choose our thoughts that we're having about things. So what if someone said you're, you're no longer allowed to feel that emotion of guilt tied back to this situation or... Right. Your loved ones. Yeah, oh, well, there's, there's that in my, I'm working on a second little devotional type book, uh, reflections of grief type of thing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I have it's very short and very short little verses. It says, people tell me that I've grieved enough or long enough. You know, people tell me that I should move on, mm-hmm. you know, and what they don't realize is, is that you're never going to move on. Right. This is part of who you are. Grief is always with you. You just get used to it. And so, you know, um, uh, it's none of their darn business. <laughs> you know, right. everyone's grief journey is uh, unique, even to the guy who's still registering his wife's car for six years. Right. I, mean, I, I don't think that's really healthy, but, you know, it's who he is and it, he has to come to his own terms. And, uh, um, you know, I just, it, it's really it, the, my my little motto for my Hallmark card is um, especially in well, for instance, there's a friends of mine had a grandson die in a tractor accident, age 22 or something like that. Mm. I mean, just starting his life and just starting his farming and all this exciting stuff for him. Just got married, and I I I told his mother. I says, you know, we're not we're not here to answer why. We're just here to help you cry. Mm. That's so beautiful. And, you know, I just think that helps kind of summarize everything because so many people think they have to say the right thing, right? Right. I mean, in your, those five deaths, I mean, what percentage of the people who talked to you said the wrong thing? (laughs) I mean, I think eventually people just stop talking. Well, and that's it too. It's safer. It's safer and it's sort of like, wow, I can't, 
even I don't even know what to say. Well, and you know, and I don't have to say. I uh, right. when I was writing the book, I said I better uh, eat my own dog food here, and I um, I brought um, unannounced, unplanned uh, lunch to two different widows at my church who had lost their husbands more recently than I lost my wife. And um, the, the, the I'm not trying to brag about it. That's no big deal. The point is, do something unannounced, mm -hmm. unplanned. I mean, you know, to call people and organize food to bring over and all that stuff, or what are you there? What can we, the, the killer question, what can I do for you? Mm. Don't ask that. Just do something. I brought them lunch. You should have seen the joy that they have. They see me at church, they just, you know, and I, I just love it. It's, it's such a simple little thing. And, you know, these are late women in their 80s. They're not spontaneous <laughs> creatures. <laughs> do they care? No, you know, and so just do something, you know, like, hey, Paul, we're going golfing um, as a threesome, not a foursome mm -hmm. uh, uh, on Sunday at three o'clock at this course. You know, you want to join us? Hell yes. Heck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> be so be spontaneous. Be willing to invite. You know, because I call it the calm after the storm in my book. You know, you you've seen it with all the deaths that you've had. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, all the activity, all the relatives come, all the food, all the gifts, all the people hanging out, and then that slowly tapers off, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And then everybody goes back to their normal routine. Well, Paul's probably okay. He looks okay, you know. And I'm not asking for help, and that's not the point. The right. point is surprise people. You know, I had, I was, I was, I won the grief lottery. I had so many friends, relatives, mm -hmm. neighbors, strangers. I mean, somebody sent a China angel after Laura died to my house mm -hmm. anonymously. And it, you know, it just, it was just amazing. And, you know, I don't know who they are. Thank you, whoever you are. And uh, just stuff like that. I won the grief lottery. Eventually, people go back to their own lives, which is fine and normal. Do right. it. That's what we all do. I went back to my normal life almost, you know, but just out of the blue now and then. Do something just to let them know that, you know, you're thinking about there is that whole stigma, the third wheel, fifth wheel thing and all that, which I don't know if you want to go into that or not. But, uh, um, you know, it, it just it just yeah, people need to um, not ignore the grieving um and i'm not saying people ignore me i'm just saying if you have a chance and think about it you know if you would have gone to a movie with paul and lisa mm -hmm. you would have gone golfing with paul and lisa well and again i i i'm just so blessed because i did and i continue to win the grief lottery not that i want to it's not the lottery i want to win <laughs> right right <laughs> well I, and well, so to that point, I'm I'm just from a place of I don't know. I'm just gonna ask. Like you have had more than your share in a very short time span with a, your wife and a child, and I think that sometimes people have thoughts and potentially judgments about grief based on if it's the age of the person or um the role or the connection that they have and it, did your grief feel different with your wife than it did with your child it is different um and you know i mean it, it's it's heresy perhaps to 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 call my daughter a soulmate i mean we, but we were joined i mean this was a this was a bipolar child who was very high maintenance. So I'm not saying this is, um, you know, Dick Van Dyke and the white picket fence mm -hmm. and all this, far from it. Um, police visited our homes more than once. But it, mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, uh, um, the point is that that she was, she her, her, whatever, acorn didn't drop very far from the tree or whatever. We were, we were, we just loved to just sit and get into it and talk and and, yeah. laugh and and we had so many similar inside jokes uh and, and that you know I, I miss that and I, I still find stuff around the house from her and you know and I um anyway it, it there's triggers there too 
but, um, you know, she did not live with us for the last two years. She lived with her fiance. And mm -hmm. so she was going about her adult life, even though she was tethered to oxygen 24 seven. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, and so there's that progression in life that the children move up and move on and, and that kind of thing. So that was good. Um, and then COVID, we didn't see him as much as we wanted to, of course. But, um, you know, with my wife, you know, it, she's my wife. She's my soulmate. Uh, I, I, I probably pester the heck out of my good friends via text because I, 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 I'm seeking that constant uh, diatribe of, of inside jokes. <laughs> and I guess I had that with both of them. So they're similar to both. But again, Laura had moved out. And so it was just Lisa. But, um, you know, I don't know. It, it, it is different because, you know, there's more history, obviously, with Lisa. Mm -hmm. But really, there's only about 10, or 10 more years of history there because we had, had Laura then. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have felt that it's different before. Um, you know, we always knew Laura was short for this world because of her many health issues. Mm. And, but it's still still shocking when it actually happens. But it, we have the the benefit, if you will, of a of a prolonged thing there. So there was not a surprise. You know, we're able to communicate, say goodbyes. She was she was a very spiritual person. She was. Her, her credo was not more than this body, more than this body, and more than this mind. Mm -hmm. And if there was ever anybody who was ready to go in the world, it, it was her. And, yeah. um, and, and, and yeah, that was very peaceful, you know, with, with Lisa. I mean, she was ill for many years, but uh, I, I had more anger about that. So I think then, you know, like, why, why did this have to happen this way? And so, they were different that way. Yeah. Thanks for being my psychiatrist. Well, <laughs> I'm listening. Yeah. And I, I know that there are people that are listening to this podcast that have lost their child. And I know um, there are people who have lost parents. And yeah. Well, again, I compare my story with her. I mean, pretty much got to say goodbye, um, you know, and all that. And again, she was very ready. Mm -hmm. And she and she, at, at, as people will see at the Endless Journey uh, uh, banquet, uh, you know, she she trying to inspire other people. I'll show that video. Mm. And, uh, you know, and, and so I feel for those, I, I know several people who lost children in automobile accidents and such, yeah. or even hunting accident. And, you know, and I, I feel sorry for them because they didn't have what I had. And so hence my, my thoughts from grief to gratitude. Yeah. I'm so grateful for this time with you. Well, and me thank for, you. Me also for my time with you, Michelle. You're a you're a kid, kind soul, a kindred soul, and I think you'll just do nothing but succeed because your your work is not about money or fame or anything. It's about service. And I can just tell that about you when I met you in person and and today as well. Thank you. Very, very much. And there's no shortage of people out there who need both of us. <laughs> they need us both to keep showing up. It's part of the circle of life. It really is. That's right. and, uh, yeah. You know, I, that's, I, I, I love, uh, I love uh, Endless Journey's name. I have to ask, uh, ask Melanie how, how she mm -hmm. came up with that name. Do you know? Uh, um, last year at the gala, she shared it's because love literally never ends. Okay it's an endless our love is an endless journey so perfect perfect, perfect. as i remember it that yeah. is what she had shared. yeah michelle thank you so much for this opportunity uh i <clears throat> people are telling me that men grieve too is helpful to them and great uh, for, that, for that i am grateful and uh i'm i'm glad to get to know you better and look forward to our future conversations you as well and i will put a link to purchase um is it on amazon For the book? Book? yeah yeah, yeah. You bet. okay so i'll put a link in the show notes so people can just click and click and get it thank you so much thank you so much take care